aquatic vegetation, or SAV. It's a term that includes seagrasses, estuarine plants, and freshwater plants. They're all fully submerged, and they are rooted vascular angiosperms. So fully submerged, except for sometimes the reproductive parts. They stick up above the water. SAV are the only group of angiosperms, or, or flowering plants, that return to the sea after evolving on land. So they differ from macroalgae in that, in that fashion. Macroalgae never left the, the ocean in the first place. So seaweeds, macroalgae, and seagrasses, and other vascular plants are two different things. SAV are, they occur on every continental margin in the world except for Antarctica. You can see that this is a kind of a map of species diversity. The Indo-Pacific is kind of a diversity hotspot, up to 15 species in this region. Other areas only have a few. In the Chesapeake Bay, we actually have about 17 species of underwater grasses that are commonly observed. We only have one true seagrass, and that is eelgrass. So on that map, you can see, sorry, uh, <coughs> you know, diversity doesn't look as high here, but they're referring to the one seagrass that we have in this region. And that is, eh, gone the wrong way, um, eelgrass or Zostera marina. That occurs down in the polyhaline region. The other common species we see frequently are wild celery, redhead grass, sago pondweed, and widgeon grass. In this area, we've got a lot of widgeon grass. I won't spend too much time on the details of this, but we also have a couple of common non-native species. So most of our species are native to the Chesapeake Bay. Some of them are not native, but all SAV in our, our minds are created equal. And so we do not discriminate against them. They all count towards our restoration goals. And we don't do anything to actively manage against our non-native species. <coughs> So other SAVs commonly observed in the bay, got a whole list of them, I won't go through all this, but there are several, lots of SAV here, lots of SAV species. And you can see from these pictures that they exhibit a really wide variety of growth forms. There are some that look like tape grasses, some that look very bushy in the water, huge variety, it's very interesting. And these plants are distributed throughout the bay based primarily on their salinity tolerance. So like I said, we only have one seagrass that occurs down in the polyhaline or the salty area of the bay. When you move up into the slightly fresher water, the mesohaline area, diversity increases. We see about three or four species commonly. The dominant species in this area is widgeon grass. And then as you move up the bay into fresher water, you really see a huge expans expansion of diversity. We have probably 12 species in our freshwater systems. And they're all pretty commonly observed. Wild celery is one of our most common, though. So as salinity increases, your diversity goes down. As salinity decreases, your diversity goes up. So in 2017, we had the most SAV ever mapped in the Bay before. We had 104,843 acres mapped by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Um, that was a 7% increase from the year before, and in fact, for the last five years, we've seen a steady increase of baywide SAB. So that's excellent news. We're, we're increasing. There are, you will notice on this map, this indicates that there are areas where SAB did go down between 2016 and 2017, but predominantly, things were looking pretty good last year, or in 2017. 2018 numbers are coming out today. <laughs> um, well, they're coming to us today, and we'll announce them later this month when we have a chance to actually look through the trends and assemble the data. But we'll know soon what happened last year. It was kind of an interesting year last year. Uh, so like I just said, how's this data obtained? It is um, it's obtained through the Baywide Aerial Monitoring Survey. It's conducted by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. It's been ongoing since 1984, so we have over 30 years of baywide SAV data, which is pretty huge. Uh, they collect the imagery May through October based on peak biomass. So in the southern portion of the bay, we reach peak biomass um, in May. And up in the northern portion of the bay, when it's, where it's fresher and there's freshwater species, they peak out in around late August, September. So they start flying down here and fly throughout the summer. There's, about, uh, there's over 180 flight lines, so they're collecting multispectral imagery from low-flying aircraft. We're hopefully going to transition into using satellite data pretty soon, or at least supplementing 
with satellite data. For example, last year, we weren't able to fly um, every flight line because of poor weather. So we're trying to figure out how to use satellite data to make up for those missed opportunities with the flights. So why do we even care though? Why is SAV so important? You hear about SAV all the time. We do these press releases with SAV numbers. It's like, yeah, SAV is improving. But like, really, does anybody care? Why? Why is it a good thing? Um, it is actually very important. SAV is um, one of our most important habitats in the Bay. It provides food and shelter for a variety of fish, shellfish, um, all commercially, ecologically, and recreational val recreationally valuable species. Uh, ducks love it, crabs love it, and it creates this very um, diverse ecosystem in which all sorts of things live. So additionally, SAV beds absorb and filter nutrients and sediments from the water column, so they reduce the prevalence of algae blooms and the resuspension of sediment, increasing, promoting the increase in water clarity. So if you see this, this picture was taken on the same day up on the Susquehanna Flats. This was in a region that didn't have any SAV, and this was all after the big, the big flows came down last year. Uh, we went up on the bay, or on the flats a few days later. This was outside the SAV bed, and this is the water inside the SAV bed. So it, it helps, it caught all that you know, <coughs> suspended sediment, trapped it in its roots, promoted the water clarity in it inside the bed. So SAV beds also reduce shoreline erosion. They reduce wave energy and current energy with their shoots and blades, you know, up in the water column. They kind of slow things down. And then they, when they slow the water down, that helps um, baffle out and pr uh, promote the settlement of the suspended solids. And that, then they get trapped in their roots and rhizomes. So storms often do less damage in areas that have nice, dense SAV beds offshore. They also, so they're plants, they photosynthesize. So they are producing oxygen as a byproduct. That oxygen is very important to other aquatic life. So we need them in there to support things like crabs and striped bass. And very importantly, they sequester carbon, massive quantities of carbon. And uh, multiple studies have come out recently showing that SAV beds, seagrass beds, they um, show more promise for mitigating climate change than just about any other ecosystem. So also people like clean, clear water, um, and SAV, like I said earlier, promotes water clarity, so that promotes local tourism activities, tourism revenue, and increased property values. So ecosystem valuation, as we heard about earlier, is a very important um, topic right now. And along those lines, uh, at DNR we've been working on, we have a guy named Elliot Campbell that has been working on valuing different types of ecosystems and their ecosystem services. And I ask him to look into SAV and seagrasses. And this isn't complete by any means, but a couple of years ago he worked on this in 2016. And based on the 2016 data, he found that the per, an, per year value of SAV in the Bay is $220 million. So that's based on a range in value between $1,800 and $11,000 per <coughs> hectare, depending on which salinity zone you're in, because the salinity zone you know, affects the ecosystem services that are providing like the abundance of blue crabs, things like that. And it's density dependent. So the more SAV you have and the denser that SAV is, the more it's worth. And carbon sequestration was actually probably pretty dramatically underestimated. So this. This is a low number, and it also doesn't include shoreline stabilization. There wasn't enough data out there at that point to really include this, include that um, parameter in this evaluation. So $220 million for SAV in the Bay per year is, is on the low side. And that's 2016 numbers too, so we have more now. So because SAV is so incredibly important, um, for a variety of reasons. The Chesapeake Bay Program has set a goal of restoring SAV to 185,000 acres throughout the Bay. And the 185,000 acres is the sum total of individual segment goals. So you probably know the Bay Program has divided the Chesapeake Bay into 92 distinct segments. And each of those segments have SAV goals, mostly. There are a couple that don't, are considered no-grow zones. But <coughs> For the most part, each has uh, an SAV goal, 
And for example, here in Cambridge, we're on the lower chop tank. The lower chop tank segment is CHOMH2. That's chop tank mesohaline 2. And the SAV goal for this area is 1,600 acres, 1,621. So for local jurisdictions to reach their segment goals, SAV stressors need to be reduced or mitigated. So this is just a little example of the trend we like to see, like it going up. This wasn't any good, but going up significantly in the last few years. So when putting together this talk, I was trying to decide whether I was going to talk about BMPs or the stressors. And I am not a BMP expert, so I am an SAV person, and so I decided to focus on the stressors because it's really very intuitive once you know what stresses SAV, what you can do to help it. So pretty much anything that reduces water clarity and light availability will inhibit photosynthesis and therefore reduce SAV productivity. So in the Bay, the primary culprits for reduced light um, and water clarity are nutrient and sediment pollution. So when you have susp suspended sediments in the water column, it makes it turbid and cloudy, that reduce light, reduces light. And then when you have nutrients in the water column or excess nutrients in the water column, you get phytoplankton blooms and epiphytic algae growth on the leaf blades themselves. So that all reduces light. Just a few quick examples of things that contribute nutrient and sediment pollution. You know, you all are familiar with all these things. You know, lawn fertilizers, poor construction practices that lead to these muddy type messes um, seen down here. here. I'm up here pointing at my screen. Like y'all can see what I'm pointing at here. <laughs> uh, agricultural practices, stormwater runoff, impervious surface increases stormwater perfect uh, stormwater runoff, and yeah, you know, things like cows walking around in your streams. So fortunately, the Chesapeake Bay program has put together this quick reference guide for best management practices, looking at non-point source BMPs for to reduce nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediments. So I highly recommend everybody <coughs> check that out. It's on the Bay program website. But those three things aren't the only things that reduce uh, water clarity and light availability. Things like shading from overwater structures also uh, limit light for plants, like docks, piers, marinas, boats, boathouses. Everything is going to reduce the light available. And shading from things like invasive species. We've got water chestnut infestations in a few of the rivers in the bay. And it, when it gets thick like this, that's just a carpet of floating plants that eliminates any potential habitat underneath. Likewise, anything that causes direct physical disturbance will reduce SAV productivity. So there are some commercial fishing activities like um, hydraulic dredging that impact SAV. A thing I call convenience harvesting as SAV has recovered in the bay. Not everybody is ex excited about it as I am. Some waterfront homeowners think it's a complete nuisance gets in the way of their recreation and boating accessibility, and they harvest it. They um, pull it up. And it's legal to an extent, but um, so I call it convenience harvesting. You can hire harvesters up in some areas of the bay to come in and essentially mow the SAV along your shoreline. They're only supposed to do it in order to grant navig navigable access. So they shouldn't be like clearing a swim beach or anything like that. Um, high flow leading to scour and burial is a problem. Conowingo opens its gates once in a while and sediment goes everywhere and that's caused some changes in uh, the SAV abundance in the Susquehanna Flats because it kind of gets wiped out by all the, the scour. And then of course anchor scars and prop scars are fairly common in SAV beds in shallow water. Mm. Anything that leads to an imbalance in the ecosystem can, I should have said can instead of will, um, reduce SAV productivity. So this one is not as um, obvious, but overfishing can lead to a problem with SAV abundance. Um, in that, so overfishing affects the, um, the SAV by totally throwing off the food chain. When you reduce the larger predators, like the trophy fishing, uh, you reduce the large predators, that leads to an abundance of small to medium sized fish. And then those small to medium sized fish overeat the grazers that are responsible for taking care of the epiphytes growing on the SAV blades. So when you knock back those grazers, you have an overabundance of epiphytes. 
and that leads to a loss of your SAV. So this is actually compounded by nutrient pollution. So in areas where you don't have as much epiphytic growth because your, your water's not as nutrient rich, it's not as dramatic as an impact, but here it would be. And then of course there are climate related impacts. The reduced SAV, this is, there are so many. <laughs> um, and this is just touching on some of them. So sea level rise will affect SAV productivity in a number of ways, but one of them is through shoreline armoring. As sea levels rise, people um, put shoreline armoring in place and that's been shown to reduce the trajectory or change the tra trajectory of SAV recovery. Uh, Bill's gonna talk about that more later. Um, it also makes it so that SAV can't migrate inland. There's a physical barrier, so as the waters rise, this won't be habitat because there'll be essentially a wall in the way. Um, with climate change, you get aquatic invasive species. We have heat events that knock back the SAV. Our seagrass, Zostra marino, eelgrass down in the southern portion of the bay is very susceptible to heat events. And then we have pathogens like labyrinthula. This is what caused the eelgrass wasting disease back in the 1930s. Wiped out like 90% of the eelgrass in the entire uh, North Atlantic. And it was due to this pathogen. And interestingly, so the pathogen is pretty much always present, but when, it's, when the plants are living in an already stressful environment, it just makes them that much more susceptible. So, um, who knows what's gonna happen with you know, pathogens as climate changes. Ocean acidification probably won't actually be that big of an issue for grasses because they do like CO2. Uh, but all of the other implications from ocean acidification may alter that. Anything reducing habitat availability will reduce SAV productivity. So because SAV is light limited, it grows close to the shoreline in the shallow water. And so any shoreline activity will impact um, SAV productivity recovery, uh, potential for recovery. So aquaculture is one of those things that's happening along the shoreline. Uh, so there's potential for a conflict there. Uh, burial and change in bathymetry from sedimentation can lead to a loss of habitat. And then I just mentioned bulkheads and riprap prevent inland migration. So that could reduce habitat availability. So when you're planning for SAV recovery, when you all are trying to reach your SAV restoration goals specific to your segments, essentially it's, it's pretty intuitive. Anything to mitigate all of these stressors will help facilitate the recovery of SAV in the Bay. And the Chesapeake Bay program and DNR can help uh, guide your planning. We are working on segment specific descriptions. Bill's gonna talk about that later. Um, but we're, per segment, going through the history of SAV um, why it's done well or why it hasn't done well in those specific regions. Um, we have these phase three WIP principles. They talk about the co-benefits of various BMPs. And then of course I mentioned earlier the quick reference guide for BMPs. Okay, and I did that really fast. So, <laughs> thank you. Anything before we run away? Questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was surprised, uh, and I don't understand <coughs> the uh, relationship you said of um, SAVs and uh, um, CO2 absorption as a major uh, 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 component to controlling uh, climate change. Do you? Can you elaborate on the relationship between um, SAVs and uh, uh, CO2? Yeah, so the question is how do seagrasses and other SAVs... Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so the question was how do seagrasses and other species of SAV and SAV beds help um, mitigate climate change, right? Yeah. So SAV are plants, obviously they, um, they take in CO2 to photosynth photosynthesize. I'm not talking about today. And so they actually form a carbon sink in the ocean. So they, they're drawing CO2 from the atmosphere um, and they lock it up in their biomass, essentially, and down in the, the roots. So as they, as they grow, they take in more CO2. There's kind of a continuous pump of CO2 into the grass beds. 
and as they and they release oxygen as a byproduct as they're photosynth photosynthesizing and so they grow and then as they slough off their leaves as the leaves senesce and die that becomes part of the detrital food web it gets further buried in the sediments or consumed by other critters and the um, the carbon also gets locked up in the roots and rhizomes for and it can stay locked up in those roots and rhizomes for decades and centuries so it's kind of a, a carbon pump yeah um based on what we know about climate change projections how close are we or how long do we have with eelgrass in the southern bay and how far are we from a more heat tolerant species making its way north <laughs> i know it's very specific there's a wall there brooke <laughs> so we have actually had several heat events in the last decade or two that well two i guess um that have significantly impacted the eelgrass in the southern portion of the bay so wiped out a great deal of it it's come back in years um, where the heat hasn't been as stressful and you know that there is eelgrass as far south as north carolina so one of the things about all this is that even though it's a it's a cold water plant and not very tolerant of heat clear water makes it much more tolerant of the heat stress so if we can keep the water clean it can survive that heat better so part of our tmdl and everything clearing up the water cleaning up the water that will help eelgrass survive um, in terms of other species coming north probably not there's a species that's very similar to um to eel well not to eelgrass but it's very similar to rupia it's called uh, halliduli and there's some in north carolina but in terms of subtropical species probably none of the other subtropical species would be able to make it this far north um, but potentially halliduli it's called shoal grass so but <laughs> thank you so much Barbara. that was wonderful